active uh, discussion as to whether we should be doing the adjuvant chemotherapy for any pancreatic cancer patient. And it has come to sort of uh, be uh, agreed by most of us that at least for those with borderline resectable, we should be doing chemotherapy up front. I would argue that we should probably do that also for patients with resectable disease, but that's still not, uh, we, we still don't have really, or we didn't have data until now. Now, uh, in addition to a number of uh, single institution studies, mostly pioneered by MD Anderson looking at these, but also other institutions, we have some retrospective data looking at the National Cancer Database where uh, they show that those patients, yellow line, that received the adjuvant chemotherapy survived longer than those that went to upfront resection. Now, this can uh, easily be criticized because there's a selection bias here as only those patients who received the adjuvant and went to surgery are accounted here, so we are selecting patients with a, a better disease uh, biology. But something that it's obvious is that uh, Using neoadjuvant chemotherapy leads to downstaging with increasing the percentage of positive lymph nodes as well as decreasing the percentage of R1 resections or resections with positive uh, margins. So obviously downstaging with neoadjuvant treatment. Now we have two randomized three, uh, studies that have, have been published this year. I'm not gonna go through details on the study, but the common uh, theme is increasing R0 resection when we do neoadjuvant chemotherapy or carry off chemotherapy compared to uh, upfront uh, resection. And this brings us to the second study I wanted to present you today, which is this Priopank uh, study. This is a Dutch study that was presented also at ASCO, where patients with uh, borderline resectable, or half of them were uh, resectable pancreatic cancer, most of the tumors located in the head of the pancreas were randomized to surgery up front, followed by six months of uh, gemcitabine versus chemo radiation up front. I look at this. They only give two doses of the gemcitabine prior to start the uh, chemo radiation, then went to surgery, and then four cycles of uh, gemcitabine. So the, the first comment I want to make on this one when you look at uh, patients that were able to have a resection, 60% of the chemo, on the neoadjuvant arm, this is expected. We know that when we are doing neoadjuvant treatment, we're gonna uh, identify 30% of the patients that are going to have metastatic disease on restaging CAT scan. We're not losing a window of opportunity with those patients. We are actually sparing patients who are going to progress immediately after the Whipple from going a procedure through a procedure that is not going to have any impact or any benefit in these patients. However, what is a little bit concerning is that those that go to surgery up front, we see that th close to 30% of them are found not to be resectable either at the, at the time of resection, which that is telling us is that with the current staging systems, we are uh, understaging a number of these uh, patients. And why this is important is because two years ago, this uh, work from UK, this uh, uh, study looking at the role of adding PET to staging in pancreatic cancer patients uh, was presented and showed that 20% of uh, the patients had the decision of going to resection modified by the results of a PET. So we were, they were able to identify those patients who should not be going to a front resection by adding a PET to multi-detector CAT scan. So this study was just published. The NCCN guidelines have a comment to consider adding PET in addition to multi-detector CT scan. The ESMO guidelines yet have no mention about it, but the ESMO guidelines, uh, I believe the last ones are from uh, pancreatic cancer from 2016. Now, I think it's important to know that when we have a patient who presents with biliary obstruction, it's not uncommon if we add a PET to the multi-detector CAT scan to have a positive PET in the liver because those dilated bile ducts may actually lie down on the, uh, on the PET. So this again emphasizes the importance of doing some neoadjuvant treatment on these patients to test the biology of the disease and then let the disease declare itself. If those are indeed metastatic signs of disease, we will identify them at the time of restaging cancer. Now, similar to the data uh, from those two randomized trials that I just presented, the rate of R0 resection of negative margins doubled in the neoadjuvant treatment arm. 
and this is the uh, survival data. You can see that there's a nice improvement in survival when, uh, the, when they compare neoadjuvant chemo radiation versus surgery up front. They did also this exploratory analysis where they actually look at those patients that were able to go through surgery to sort of have a way to compare to uh, those uh, uh, to the adjuvant studies. And you can see that the median survival was 42 for those patients who went through chemo radiation and were able to have resection versus only 17 months for those patients who uh, had a resection followed by uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, what is my take on this study? It certainly validates neoadjuvant strategies. We cannot say any longer we don't have positive randomized phase three trials that have shown benefit of neoadjuvant treatment compared to adjuvant uh, strategies. It is not a new standard of care. Why this is not a new standard of care? The use of systemic chemotherapy, they use a suboptimal regimen. We have better backbones of chemotherapy than gemcitabine single agent. And actually, if you look at uh, the swap trial on, uh, that has recently been completed in the new adjuvant setting, they use fulfidinox or gemabraxin, which is what most of uh, the institutions doing new adjuvant treatment will uh, do. So only two doses of gemcitabine prior to going to local regional treatment with chemo radiation. That's a suboptimal approach. We want to give the best treatment up front. We want to give the best systemic treatment up front because pancreatic cancer is a systemic disease. Suboptimal selection of the radiosensitizer. We have data from the SCALOP trial in the locally advanced setting showing that uh, Cape Cytobin, it's a better uh, drug to combine with radiation compared to gemcitabine, improve overall survival but also better toxicity profile compared to gemcitabine. And lastly, as I said, 72% uh, of the uh, patients who went to surgery up front uh, were able to have resection. So that speaks highly that we need to improve our staging uh, methods. And the way to do that is to not replace but add a PET to multi-detector uh, CT based on the pet pan study data. Now, uh, this is uh, the stop and go strategies are very well known in colorectal cancer, right? Uh, we have uh, regimens in pancreatic cancer with oxalic planning, and the question that the next study I'm going to present uh, address was whether we can drop oxalic planning from fulfidinox after a number of months and whether that has an impact in the efficacy of the treatment. So this is again a French uh, study. As you can see, the, the French group has been very active at uh, ASCO, not only at ASCO, they, they, they have a, an amazing cooperative group that has made uh, strong uh, contributions to the GI field in the last uh, 20 years. And uh, you can see the design of the study. Patients with stage four metastatic pancreatic cancer were randomized to standard fulfidinox for six months or fulfidinox uh, for four months then at that time, drop the oxalic platin and continue with maintenance 5-FU. And then a third arm, uh, based on some uh, data that they have generated on smaller trials, where patients received two months of fulfiti, then were switched to gemcitabine, two months back to fulfiti, and then at the time of progression, they were switched to the chemotherapy backbone that they were not receiving at the time of uh, progression. So you can see uh, over close to 300 patients enrolled and primary endpoint of uh, six months progression-free survival rate. These are the study arms that I already uh, mentioned, and uh, apologies for the blurry slide. And this is the progression-free survival rate. So you can see 47% uh, uh, for the uh, arm of patients that were on fulfilling out uh, six months, 44% for the group of patients that dropped oxaliplatin after four months, and definitely uh, uh, the, the data seem uh, inferior than that uh, arm with uh, fulfidium and uh, gemcitabine. So you can look at the median survival, also similar, but with a trend for the uh, arm of patients where oxalic planning was dropped to do better at the end. So there's clearly a separation of the curves. And indeed, when you look at overall survival, 18 months overall survival, you can see that uh, this was uh, this was exploratory analysis, of course, but this uh, improved from 18% uh, to close to 28 months 
which suggests that these patients where you drop oxaliplatin after four months may act or could potentially uh, do better. Now, this is interesting because the percentage of patients that receive uh, treatment uh, beyond progression uh, was actually higher in the arm of folfirinox, and the arm that received folfirinox for six months, 62% versus 54%. Uh, what was a little bit surprising is that despite of this approach of dropping the oxaliplatin, the incidence of grade three neuropathy was higher in that group of patients where oxaliplatin was dropped after four months. You can see 18 versus 10%. This was likely related to the uh, higher density of the intensity of the oxaliplatin. These patients who had oxaliplatin reintroduced later on did not uh, have more neuropathy in the initial period of six months. Actually, at that time, the neuropathy was less, but through the end of the course of treatment, because of that reintroduction of oxaliplatin, the neuropathy was higher compared to those patients who had received six months of uh, full feeding notes. So what is my take on this uh, study? It does not change standard of care, because we do this already in the clinic. We know that patients after three, four months Fitinos, uh, many of them are going to develop significant neuropathy and we're going to need to drop the oxalic planning uh, anyway. However, this provides uh, nice evidence to discuss with our patients. Those of you using these regimens know that when you uh, explain patients that we need to drop oxalic planning, the first question you get is, is this going to affect my disease negatively? 